Three, two, one. Three, two, one. <laughs> and we're here. <laughs> Folks, we're glad you joined us here this Tuesday at 7. If we're having some feedback here at the beginning, just ignore it because I think it'll go away. But, Truly, how are you? Truly, how are you? I'm doing fantastic today, Roger. It's good to be here. If folks are jumping folks are on jumping and they on. hear, let me know if you hear, feedback. You hear feedback. But, but, I don't know, we were talking earlier and there was no feedback and there seemed to be feedback. But, anyways, Julie, anyways, quick Julie, question. question. If you had if to you listen had to the same, music, the same music for the next six months, for the next six months same artist. same artist. What would it be? What would it be? Oh goodness. Ooh. I I think if I for 6 months I could probably do um definitely a folk band um either in extremo from Germany that's a little bit kind of folk metal. Or doing a band like Tartanic that often play at the Renaissance Fair that's a bit more bagpipes and drums. Um, I could probably dig on that for six months without issue. I love that. that. They both have produced enough albums for it to be um, a good time. (laughs) Where were you born? Where were you born? Well, um... Originally, I was born in Indiana, um, just because that's the nearest hospital to my hometown. Um, I come from a small, tiny little town, which is the largest in Preble County, and it's a little town called Eaton. Um, So I was driven across the border to Indiana to the hospital there and was born at Reed Hospital and um, lived there in Eaton for uh, the very uh, most of my life. Until, uh, of course, about 20 years ago when I moved. Gotcha. Gotcha. If you had to reflect back back to your early years, years. when was the first time you realized that you were a creative person? I definitely always had the, the desire to draw and grow things at an early age. Uh, That's what I always wanted to do because drawing just seemed to come naturally and I always wanted to doodle and then growing things. My mother would always allow me to with a tiny, tiny little plot that was no bigger than half of a foot. um, She would let me grow anything I wanted or she would set aside a pot for me to plant in and to choose what plants to put in there. Um so at an early age, I was always doing that and always getting into the dirt and, and always creating. So I've always known that at least. Where so my direction went is another another topic. Tell us about that early years. Well, do you remember as a middle school or high school kid when you got that gigantic book And emblazoned across the front of it was the generic phrase, biology. And now there's, depending on what school district you went to and what resources they had available, uh, most of those books were about the standard, even if you go back to books from the 50s. And, of course, my school did have some of those from the 50s and 60s available. uh, But most of these books were so standard, they never really changed that much. But in that almost two-inch thick book, you can't possibly cover all the information within and when you get to the topic of the fungus family even if the book itself has an entire chapter dedicated to it most of the time your instructor would only tell you that they existed and their purpose was to break down detritus and to help you know increase decomposition so they were important but going through life for most of us, if you didn't have anybody in your family circle that was taking you out to go foraging, mushrooms then end up being this mystical 
magical type of organism that's unlike anything else in our natural world. And that often causes a lot of people to be fearful of any type of mushroom that's not recognized as one of those top two supermarket ones, you know, the button mushroom or the portobello. That's what people know, and they don't want to try anything else. And they don't encourage because there's a lot of misinformation and misidentification out there. But since we live in the information age, a lot of that has improved. So when I was younger and I saw these things, they were always very fascinating. And I always wanted to learn more, but it seemed like it was always on the back burner of any portion of education, any of the ecology classes I took or botany or anything else. They just kind of, my ecology was always in the background. And it's, it's a real shame because uh, when you think about the growing number of people that are choosing to reduce uh, meat in their diets and when you go to the supermarket, you're still paying about the same price for a container of fresh mushrooms that you would pay for a pound of ground beef. And that doesn't make any sense to me. The shelf life for them is very, is, is short, but we don't even have on the, the shelves anything that's dried or anything that's more available at a better price. Because having a meatless option shouldn't put people out of their budget. It shouldn't be more expensive to eat basically produce than it is to butcher an entire animal and to process it. So I began thinking about a lot of things. And, and I went to uh, BGSU and graduated uh, with a degree in, in art, um, specifically in art education. But the job market really wasn't there as much as I would like. Mm -hmm. So I never ended up pursuing that. And I thought, well, it'd be nice if I could grow stuff or at least do something. And I spent a lot of introspective years trying to figure out exactly where my direction would go. Um, and then that's when I started looking into permaculture um, and going into seeing how Growing mushrooms could improve the community around how utilizing the land to its fullest potential to make food more readily available and cheaper and to open up options for people that are often think that they just have those two things. Mm -hmm. um, it was like people often don't like mushrooms because they don't like the texture and there's a lot of them out there that don't have that that same texture. So and, early on, you early were on. led to. Uh, led to uh, hang on just a moment. Early on, you were led to uh, understand the the value of growing. You find yourself as a creative person. And then what you do is you find yourself um, pursuing arts, following your graduation and probably realizing your, um, your journey, you returned back to permaculture and specifically mushrooms about this. But before, I want to come back to this mushroom because I am very interested in that. But in the meantime, Tell us a little bit about your creative journey. So I'm talking about high school. Um, help us understand about where you bridge, where you made the decision to go into arts, and then how you express yourself creatively. And then once we get there, and then I want to circle back, and I want to really dig into the Misty Mushroom and, and what you're doing on your end too, um, starting and launching your business, or maybe your business has already been running. But how does that sound? That'd be absolutely. That was some feedback. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Well, creatively, I I'd always loved to to draw and to paint, and so learning about a lot of the things in the university and taking those studio courses and doing the life drawing and even 
delving into fields that I was unfamiliar with, such as uh, jewelry and metalworking and uh, photography and just exploring a lot of avenues out there, um, I realized about myself was a term in, um, in like art history was a renaissance man. Uh, somebody who was talented in many fields, but not necessarily a mastery in one. And I looked at my artwork, and I, I do legitimately really like doing art. But at the same time, did I want to explore that as a business? To be matching deadlines, to be fitting those expectations. And I looked at it, and a lot of it might have taken the love that I have out of painting. And... A lot of the money out there was through digital and that just, I enjoy doing some digital, but it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. Um, I did have one of my paintings back here that I was recently working on. I haven't finished it by any means, um, but get this, yeah, That's great. and That's uh, great. But I, I worked on a lot of portraiture. I did get commissioned to do a mural out on uh, Putten Bay, uh, the little island that's that's out. Um, it's uh, out towards Sandusky, out that way in Marblehead, and. I did a, a beautiful mural inside of a bar, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, actually, through the connections of Bob Turner's daughter, Caitlin, and that was a wonderful opportunity to do that there on the island. And I realized, you know, if I did commission work, is that I wanted to do stuff that I enjoyed. And I wanted to utilize other avenues of teaching towards things that I consider to be more fruitful, if excuse the pun on that. <laughs> But I had done jewelry, um, making necklaces, and a lot of art, selling art involved a market that was always kind of hard-pressed to get into. Tell us about your time as an actor, a makeup artist, and... I see that you are, you find yourself on the other side of the camera, the model often, and what that was like and kind of, uh, talk, talk about that a little bit. When I, um, back when I was still in college, um, I had a couple of friends of mine that worked for uh, Cedar Point for their hollow weekends, and they were trying for a, new, a number of years to get me into going, um, and I finally did that for a number of years and enjoyed um, being a actor at a haunted attraction. And I wanted more. And I had always heard of the haunted hydro and from a few other friends that I had. And I went out one night as just, they told me, come on out, get your feet wet, get in character and just explore. And I never had anybody really offer me kind of like, you know, this, this bread basket where they said, come on out and have fun. And I was like, oh, and I'm used to dealing with a lot more red tape. And so the fact that they opened their arms to welcome me in as an actor. And so I went around in there and I loved it and I loved the opportunity. So I did acting there for a number of years and doing the makeup just kind of came naturally as starting when I look back at some of the photos of my early makeup, and of course it's, it's a little rough, but utilizing those techniques of painting and sculpting on the face and onto any prosthetics, it just made sense. And so going into that avenue and having that opportunity to do that and then doing the things like the monster make-off and many of the other events was was amazing uh the modeling portion i had actually gotten into um a number of years before um it's something that i had always wanted to do 
Um, but there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of places. The, the haunted hydro was not doing photo shoots at that time. Um, the Collingwood up in Toledo was doing photo shoots, um, in a similar format, but with more, um, more of black and white photography, more fashion photography, um, or glamour, I would be the word for it. And I enjoyed that. Um, I just always had wanted when I was old and gray to have photos of myself that were of that caliber to say, yeah, look at your grandma. I mean, look at her. <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely love that. Um, one of the things that I've noted as a an artist and as an admirer of solid work, the things that I've noticed is that your characters are colorful. They feel they have a botanical feel to it. The brush strokes, the colors are are it feels non haunt related. So how do those two creativities uh, fuse? Well, I mean, not many know this, but. I am the daughter of a funeral director, and I come from a long line of morticians. I, my father, my cousin, my uncle, now my brother, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather were all morticians. And so um, being uh, – we live next door to a funeral home, and so that – being next door to that and being comfortable with – uh, that concept of of decay, yet at the same time of the celebration of life, kind of really met those two together for me at an early age. And often um, as a kid, I, I wasn't watching scary movies. They weren't allowed in my house. And even as an adult, I might watch a few suspenseful ones and I'll watch a scary movie with friends but I don't choose to watch those. Um, but I definitely like the the acting. I like the thrill. And so taking that scary and then adding more to it to give people something that they don't expect, which is why some of my characters have used kazoos or accordions or pickles. <laughs> And it's, it's always fun to kind of change things up where people don't know what to expect. So I would say that as I'm understanding your, your gifts, I would say that you probably, um, your decision to go to Bowling Green to study art education is translating in ways that you may have expected or may not have expected because you have that natural, first of all, that natural teaching. You have that uniqueness. Um, you have the ability, I think, to bring in your childhood knowledge. You're connecting things in interesting ways. I'm not going to ask you some of these pertinent questions because I still want to talk a little bit about th that creativity. What other things do you find? So painting, character creation, modeling, acting um your renaissance so you're you uh you do a lot of things what have we missed creatively creatively um music wise i do appreciate music and i do like to dabble a little bit but i've never been really competent with a instrument um i have a piano i like weird instruments i have a, a zither that i that is an antique from the early 1900s that I need to get restrung and tuned. Um, but it, I have an appreciation of music, but um, the other thing would be uh, cooking. Hmm. Um, I enjoy cooking, like, you know, uh, baking <laughs> and all that other good stuff. Um, and uh, I guess, like, food prep as well. <laughs> There's trying to think of other creative things that uh fabric arts sometimes um i do a little bit of sewing uh nothing that's you know to shake a leg at but 
Um, I'll sew a few tunics or skirts and I'll do embroidery on them. Um, I've done a little bit of crochet, but I'm rotten at it. And I'll leave that to the professionals. So t tell us, take us, well, first of all, and what I'm doing is I'm just kind of turning down the volume to reduce the, uh, the feedback while I'm asked the questions and I'm turning it back up. So thank you for being so flexible in, in this, uh, weird techno glitch time. But, um, early on along the way, there's been a fascination in permaculture in mushrooms um, for those people who share this video, we're going to put your name in a drawing next week. And, and so I'm going to pause. I'm going to turn the volume back up here, pause, and then talk to us about what that giveaway is going to be for next, uh, next week. And then I'm going to come back to a question. And then I think that's going to prompt you to just talk about uh, your passion and your side business and, and what you do there. But go ahead and talk to us really quickly about um, what, people have a chance to uh to win next week i just i just released a video today regarding a mushroom that you can find in the wild called hint of the woods some call it maitake um which translates to the dancing mushroom which i always thought was very fun um this type of mushroom found in the wild grows on the base of oak trees and i have three bags that have been dried of this mushroom that does have medicinal qualities to it to help um, boost your immune system and there's other qualities to it and I explain more in my video um, all about these and also any um, risks of taking this for people that are taking certain medications. Uh, so I have all of that included um, but I have these to give away, and these are from just this past October. Um, so they're picked fresh this year. That's that's amazing. I think this is the first time that we're that we're allowing people to experience something outside of the physical. This is going to be taste and and medicinal uh, as well. Um, so as I mean, it's. I love, first of all, I love even watching your environment because your environment feels very organic. And I'm, as I'm looking behind you, I see uh, things in your house that look inviting, right? And, uh, and but, but talk about the Misty Mushroom. Talk about um, permaculture. Talk about some of those things because... I mean, it doesn't take long for somebody to realize your passion there and, uh, and what you do. And, um, and for those folks who have just heard, what we're going to do is we're going to attach that video that Julie was just talking about. We're going to attach it to this interview um, as well. So if you catch back up in an hour or so, you'll be able to check out that video as well. So uh, all right, I'm going to turn this volume back up and let you go, Julie. Oh, boy. Um, when we got the property that we, um, that we got for this house, um, one of the big things was you see a lot of people that go out every day and they mow their lawn in the summer and you have all of this land that goes unutilized, uh, by anything that would be beneficial besides, um, you know, the, the look of it. And... I thought about taking permaculture in a serious uh, way to utilize the most portion of land as possible. Um, if I were to bring it back to what really kind of ground down my, my belief system, um, a lot of people talk about sustainability. And that's the big phrase is uh, people want to be sustainable, um, especially with everything that's going on and people seeing resources, uh, crucial resources flying off the shelves and suddenly the have nots are suffering because these items are being hoarded or mass just removed from the shelves just because of the sheer number of people in a community. And a lot of people then think about sustainability that they want to escape 
and they want to go out into the middle of nowhere and they want to be completely self-sustaining. They want to gather their own rain water. They want to grow their own food and not to rely on the outside world. And I thought about a lot of the benefits of that, but also the negatives. Uh, the major negative thing I had seen with it was that you take all this information, all this beautiful knowledge on a variety of topics, and you put it in a box, and only you have access to that box. And in order to be completely self-sustaining, uh, for example, I'd have to have the time to go out and collect bags of acorns, rinse them very, you know, for many times, and then dry them, crack them, grind them into a flour, and then use that flour to bake with. Now, if you've got an entire village and you've got an entire community, that makes a bit more sense that you would go out with a group and then you would prepare that for your entire community. But a lot of the self-sustaining takes away that concept of community. And so I started then to look into homesteading instead. And I wanted to be able to work with the community versus against it and to be able to improve uh, versus running away. And so I looked into, like, if we were to grow maybe just two or three apple trees, we might get five bushels of apples. And our family, after I go through and I process apples for us in storage or give away to a few friends and family, I'm going to have two bushels of apples left over that those should go to people in need. Those should go to people that, that really are suffering. And there's no reason for me to sell apples with the amount of like big orchards that make that a business. And also with uh, money, a lot of things about the trade system and the barter system have been lost, and a lot of people are trying to boost that back up. Um, because I don't have a liquor license, and I and I make I make mead, like this bottle of hibiscus mead, um, is is really beautiful, um, but I can't sell it for obvious reasons. So, you know, I tell people, I say, well, barter with me trade me things you know maybe you trade me honey and i give you this and or you trade me you know plants and you know for permaculture and then i can do this but um there was a really good guide online uh regarding permaculture tree guilds um Anybody, if they're interested in the link, I can always provide that. But um, it's Midwest Permaculture Presents Plant Guilds. And it is completely a free document that is, um, it, it's, a, it's a lengthy document, but it talks very easily on taking one tree and what you plant around it. Um, planting fruit bearing bushes. Um, growing a bunch of things that were making sense and were beneficial to each other. Um, so in the part of me breaking down the land and thinking about what am I going to grow? Where am I going to put it? How big is it going to get? How many years will it take to get in a sizable condition for it to be harvested? Um, that's quite the endeavor. And I, I wanted to be able to teach others about it because when I tried to look into it as an outsider, um, there was just so much information. It was a little, it was a little overwhelming. Um, let me. And, and, but you keep ducks as well, and so how does how do how does ducks and maybe some other critters and i'm using critters as a wide open uh thing because i don't know whether that's bees or or what that is but uh but talk about critters and how that fits into your model and your ideas ideas 
What is that? What is that? That's a toad. Oh, and she just peed on me, of course. Nope. <laughs> she is absolutely full of water. Um, I had that that toad. She was burrowing into every single one of my planters. And she even snuck inside and burrowed herself into one of the planters that I had in the garage. I figured that she wanted to winter inside, so I brought her in here so that I could... I, I also have dubia cockroaches, and I thought, well, I've got food for her, so I might as well just keep her until the spring, and then I'll release her again. Um, I A lot of people keep chickens... And I had looked into having some type of animal that would be the most beneficial for the area. And funny enough, um, I'm actually going to write a paper about ducks versus geese in the Middle Ages. Um, I also am um, involved in the SCA, which is the Society of Creative Acronism. Um, so it's all about the Middle Ages, anywhere from, um, I guess you could say, um, early times all the way to the early Italian Renaissance. And so it's a huge chunk of time that you can research. Um, but I always was curious on why uh, mainly in Europe, they raised geese over ducks. It wasn't in Europe that they went into selective breeding. That was all over in China. And so I wanted to know, well, why were ducks chosen? And ducks were utilized because of the rice fields. And the ducks go through the rice fields and they feed on all of the bugs and they don't damage the plants. So because we're so waterlogged up here next to the lake and we get a lot of high water um and i looked into a lot of their benefits they they can uh, last through the cold much better than chickens um they eat a lot more bugs they don't tear up the grass they don't do the scratching that chickens do uh if you get new ducks they're not going to have any issue incorporating them into the already established flock uh, there is no pecking order. Um, you just have to keep the ratio of males and females at the same, or more females than males. And also their um, their waste is high in nitrogen, which was going to be great for the garden. And uh, their eggs, uh, the khaki Campbell ducks produce more eggs uh, a year than a chicken does. So that was the other option, is I was like, all in all, I was like, well... I wanted ducks, and funny enough, the the husband was like, well, I don't know. And I was I was telling him about the benefits, and he's like, well, we'll think about it. And I said, excellent. And then um, when he was at work, one of the um, one of the guys was mowing the, the lawn outside of the armory and had accidentally hit a, a uh, mallard that was on her nest. Uh, she flew out and uh, got hit, and so there were these eggs, and he brought them home, and then I had to incubate them. <laughs> so I incubated these eggs, and unfortunately, only one of them hatched, and you can't just have one duck. They they need to have more. So then I was like, well, I'm getting more ducks. <laughs> so we we have ducks now, and they are silly. But they're they're really good, but they also are escape artists. So there's that. I, I tell you what, I know that if my wife Beth is not already watching, she will watch this, and uh, and, and you're going to light a fire that uh, um, that might uh, result in us having some ducks around here as well. But I, I'm not sure our homeowners association would be quite as happy as 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 we would be. But I mean, I, I love that explanation. Um, so you were creative. You caught this growing bug. You um, 
you come from a, a lineage of um, funeral directors and morticians. You have this feel and, and you have this like you grew up around decay. And do, do are the, would you say psychologically or maybe consciously that as you're kind of focusing right now and you and it feels to me as though you're really specializing in mushrooms um, – Talk to us, like dig, dig into the whole mushroom thing, like medicinal purposes. Like, uh, is it related? And and uh, and talk to us, you know, all the way to the misty mushroom and catching your YouTube channel and, and what's going on there because I'm really excited to hear about that. Well, when you know, thinking about uh, decay and and thinking about like just decomp in general and how it, you know, it's a natural thing, but it often is not talked about. And, you know, going back to the supermarket options of only having two things. And, you know, as a kid, you're told not to pick mushrooms cause they could be, they could kill you. And there, there are a lot of mushrooms out there that are very toxic and that can harm people in a in a big way um so it is wise to be careful uh but you couldn't believe how many messages i get where people ask me about just what's growing out in their yard and will their dog eat it and what it what it what happens if their dog eats that mushroom that's growing out in the grass and you know the amount of people that don't know that was just one of those things that i was just like i love mushrooms they're they're fascinating to look at. They're, they just suddenly, they, they bloom, and then they're gone. And so I was looking into growing them, and what could we do, um, how much would it cost, how easy is it? And I learned that most mushrooms are very easy to grow. I mean, it's, it's mainly just making sure that the stuff is cleaned, um, but even then, I've heard other growers, other cultivators talk about that you don't have to go into all those like crazy sanitation. Um, you do it mainly to protect your your growth. Like this right here. Um, let me see if I can get it under better light. That right there is a morel culture. And morel mushrooms is one of those one of those things that most people they say cannot be grown inside or it can't be cultivated. And so you want to protect those against other bacterium. Um, it's kind of funny that you would grow fungus in a clean environment. But um, I thought about, you know, what, what could I do? This has been in this jar since March, um, early March, just growing away. And I'll, I'll end up putting it out into uh, some of the wood piles uh, with some molasses. And we'll go with that and see if maybe we get some morels next year. Um, but l looking into, like, I love bones. I love going through a forest and finding these interesting alien creatures that just kind of pop up and grow and uh, looking at the medicinal qualities as i started to look into mushrooms in general there's so many that have uh qualities to them that nobody knows in the main public um even common um, weeds that you would find out in your yard that most people consider noxious. Um, I did a video on, on my Misty Mushroom channel where I talked about the Asiatic daylily mm -hmm. and the health benefits and that it can be eaten. And a lot of people were very amazed at this common weed that they find that is quite noxious, that it can be eaten and it can be good for them. And mushrooms was the same thing. It's like, wait, this this could lower my cholesterol? And, you know, looking at the, the uh, hint of the woods, it's like, 
in a cup of this, it's only 22 calories. And this is full of vitamin D. And there's a little bit of iron in it and a little bit of fiber. And I'm like, that's that's food that people aren't talking about. So thinking about ways to live with our environment and to be able to utilize everything as a whole. Uh, my goal this year was uh, major recycling. Uh, starting... Uh, from last January, but even a little bit before then, um, we had started composting. We had started uh, making sure that everything was recycled. Um, if a product was uh, available in a wooden, or not wooden, I'm sorry, a cardboard container versus a plastic one, then we would go for the cardboard container first um, because it's harder to recycle plastic. So, you know, looking into that as a whole to just try and lower our footprint. And, you know, I guess you could say I'm a tree hugger. I mean, I do talk to, you know, to the trees. I, I You could call me a druid. But I I just felt like we had a better better way to manage the world around us. And it doesn't matter what religion you have or have not. Um, everybody has this concept ingrained within them uh, to shepherd the world around them. And that when you mistreat the land, bad things happen. It's just most people are careless and they're more self-absorbed. And I thought, if I could just impart some of this information on the utilization of the land and improving people's lives and doing it in a way that would be affordable and not break the budget. I mean, our, our fence out back is made from recycled pallets. The duck coop is made from recycled barn wood and uh, also pallet wood and other things. And the mushroom growing room that I have out in the garage is, is made from free plexiglass that we picked up. I think the most that we spend money on, unfortunately, is those, those long two-by-fours that, you know, we just have to use those for support. Um, but build materials, materials are getting way expensive for people to purchase. And I just thought, I got to find a way that people can enjoy life around them, even if they live in a tiny apartment um, and they have a very small area that they can benefit from. Um, maybe it can implore them to work with other people in their community to have like a garden or also for people that are in areas like myself that have the land to grow more, to step up and to produce more. I'll tell you what, I am digging this uh, niche topic. Um, I hadn't really thought about mushrooms. Let me show you just uh, a, a really brief story. So I was a middle school, I think. I think it was middle school. And we woke up one day, and, and we lived at the end of a cul-de-sac. And we woke up one day, and I don't remember what it was, but I think my dad told me, to go grab the basketballs out of out of the backyard. And we you know, it was kind of wooded back there. And I went over there and there were like two giant mushrooms. They looked like basketballs. And I went over there and I was and, and I knew that they were not a basketball. And and, and I walked over to, and they were basketball sized things and I was like, Dad, I don't know what the heck these are, but uh um, and I don't even remember what it was that I did, but I I took that large, I took a one of them. There was a smaller one, and then maybe I think two big ones. And I took the smaller one in to school with me, and I took it to my biology teacher. I'm like, so what the heck is this? It, it didn't appear like it was here yesterday. We woke up and it was here. And he said, I think he said, and I mean, remember this is probably like. 35, 40 years ago. He's like, I think he said it was a puffball. And he said, they're edible. And so I went home and I was like, dad, those are mushrooms. And 
if, and, and my dad didn't really care. He was like, let's eat those things. And so we went back there. We cut them. We made these wonderful mushroom, like burgers, out of those things. And so that was my first brush. But I really love this topic of mushrooms. Um, and so com- I'm going to turn the volume back up. A comment on puff balls and then also kind of the medicinal purposes. And, you know, not only is it a sustaining food, but what should we what should we know about mushrooms and, and what they can do to our health and, you know, maybe some resources that we should, uh, besides subscribing to the Misty Mushroom on YouTube, what all other resources should we, you know, consider? Well, you know, puffballs are great because um, as long as they're fully white, like all the way down, they're edible. Um, when they start to break down, when they start to actually re- get ready to release all of their spores, uh, they turn more yellow. Um, and a lot of people talk about how you peel them and, and slice them up and fry them up or uh, they kind of taste like French toast. And um, so that is awesome because you were saying that and I was thinking about I'm in a foraging group and this guy had a picture where he had this gigantic one. And his comment in the group said that his chicken led it led him to it. And I thought that that was so funny because that was like, you know, just so iconic. Um, with um, resources, I have so many books um, about mushrooms in general. It gets a little ridiculous because um, identification can be the biggest uh, issue in foraging. Uh, There are mushrooms that, depending on what they're growing on, that same mushroom could be a few different colors. Um, The spores will still be the same color, but uh, we'll say oyster mushrooms in particular, uh, you can find them uh, white and gray, uh, pink, yellow and even blue and with any of them i recommend for people to join uh foraging groups that is first and foremost what i recommend because you usually have an access to a bunch of people that are online Uh, the highest recommendation is to take a good photo of the mushroom um, a nice clear picture of the top of it, the underside and the stem and what it's growing in. Uh, these are very important for somebody to identify it because if you take a picture, like a puffball is, is pretty easy to identify because they're iconic. Um, but even with a morel mushroom, there are lookalikes um, that are just bad. And the um, the experts out there, you know, and there's a lot of people that they've been doing it for years and foraging. And I don't want to say that I'm an expert picking out one random, you know, white mushroom that is the standard out of a yard and being able to tell somebody with a blurry photo what it is. <laughs> but... I definitely encourage people to join foraging groups. I'm in one that's uh, an Ohio group, um, which not only covers mushrooms, but covers other things that you can find in the woods. And people talk about them during those seasons and where they're at and what they're finding. Um, I thought those were really great. And there are a lot of videos out there for people to access. Um, One that was new to me this year was uh, Ringless Honeys. And that's a delicious mushroom. And I found a couple of clumps of those uh, while I was hiking around. Um, There's a lot of those that I would love to cultivate. Um, I just need to get the proper trees going for them to be permacultured in. Uh, Because there's some that will only grow symbiotically with a certain tree. And others like the the hen of the woods that are parasitic and they feed mainly on oak trees. Um, So 
getting that all together and trying to identify them can be a bit daunting, which is what drives some people away. But like I have, I have so many books. I mean, that's one. Um, let's see. Um, there's this guide. Um, and then let's see. I've got edible wild plants. Uh, let's see, that one's all about perennials. I know I have more mushroom guides hiding out in my book collection. Um, and then websites galore. But I, I just, um, I have a couple of guides that go with me, um, you know, wherever I go. And they're, they're informative, but again, sometimes most foragers will just take, they'll take mushrooms with them and they'll take them home and then they'll identify them. Uh, so they'll get them all together and then they'll do spore prints and then they're like, yes, we can eat this one. So even an expert will still do those double checks. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So show us again what uh, – so for those people who are sharing and, and so show us again here. But before you do that, I'm going to just go through and I'm going to talk a little bit about – there's a whole bunch of people who are tuning in, watching. Um, we're talking about people who have done some trading. Um, Jennifer Hartley says uh, um, canning. um some of her trading. I'm going to, I'm just scrolling here. I'm trying to multitask and I'm not great at multitasking. Uh, Beth will uh, attend to that, my wife. But um, Mel Cherney says she traded quail eggs for art supplies. Um, we've got people saying great guest. Uh, we do have a question. So if you would do this, first of all, show us again what what uh, if you share this video to your friends group, and I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this. But I think those folks that are willing to lean in and listen to some of these details are going to be their interest is going to be picked by what you have to offer. So show us that, and then the question is, what are your some of your favorite mushroom recipes or the way to eat those things? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Um, so again, I'm, I'm offering these, uh, dried bags of the hen of the woods that I gathered, um, just this last month. And I've got three bags of them to, to give out. Um, these can, because they're dried, they store really well. They're vacuum sealed. All they need to be is, uh, put into a soup. Um, usually there's, a uh, kind of a, a few Asian soups that they go good in, but a good chicken noodle soup, just toss them in. Um, they'd be great in there. Um, usually when you dry them, that's the best option is just to put them in a soup. Um, favorite mushrooms and favorite mushroom recipe. That's, that's rough because I really do like oyster mushrooms but most people say that they're just such a common mushroom that they don't really have much pizzazz. Um, I, of course, I love morels. And most people talk about morels like they're the holy grail of mushroom. And that that's up there almost with ginseng where you don't want to tell anybody where your morels were found. Um and you can, by the way, there's a morel map on a website that'll show you where people have found them, kind of an idea. In the spring, if you keep track of that, you can see when they're about to fruit in your area. So you know that usually my cousin down in my hometown posts up, and I know it'll only be, may it be a week or two, and then I'll start finding them. Um Favorite recipe, though, I think is uh, utilizing them in a, in a ravioli. Um, I really like a good mushroom ravioli uh, with a good cream sauce. It's just, it, it's very tasty. 
Um, also, most of the time, I'll admit, we when we find a good mushroom, we just do a real basic saute on them because we want that flavor and we don't want it to be mashed with anything. And then we'll make a cheese plate with some uh, crackers and some bread and some nice cheeses. And then we'll have the mushrooms added in there where we can just kind of decadently eat like we're ancient Romans, you know, enjoying our decadent lifestyle. Um, so that's that's what we do with a lot of the ones that we get. Um, having fresh oysters on a pizza, that's that's good. Um, lion's mane tastes like crab meat. That's, that's a winner. Uh, just, there's so many different options. It's hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> All right. So I've, I've got another question, two questions because I'm turning down the volume because we're dealing with some feedback issues. And so you've been, uh, and wonderfully flexible and, uh, and I kind of launch a question and then turn, the, the volume back up and we listen to you. So, um, the, the, so the two questions, the first question is going to be if you were, I mean, you had mentioned ginseng and so that, that just, that prompted the question. And the question is if you stumbled and, and it's irrelevant where, I mean, you might say I was, I just happened to be walking down a trail in the Amazon or whatever, but if you stumbled upon um, the most amazing mushroom from your vantage point. This could be any mushroom. It doesn't have to be Ohio. But to say, if, if I had a wish list, it would be to stumble upon this mushroom, whether it's its beauty, its taste, its properties, its whatever. I'd be interested in hearing that. And then after we talk about the wor- your favorite most amazing mushroom, then talk to me about some of those other things that you're doing in terms of canning, some of those other things. And then what I'd like to do is, if there's any questions, we'll come back to those. And then we're going to, I want to wrap back around and talk about the Missy Mushroom and your channel on YouTube and how we can get more of your education. And, and I'm enjoying this, so I, I, need, I want some more. But we're going to maybe wrap it up there. Um, with information, you know, on your YouTube channel and where we can get more. Um, so to start off um, with that mushroom magical find, I think the one that I've been after for so long is actually the porcini mushroom. It's the logo of the misty mushroom. That's a bullet mushroom. Uh, they have pores on the underside. It's a nice, they're, they're called like a little pig. And so it's this fat mushroom, um, and they're very delicious. I have never found an edible. I've always found the uh, bitter bullets, and you know them immediately. You pick them, and I've done it where I pick one, and I do this, and I'm just, oh, and it, it's so bitter. And I go, no, Um, we found a whole bunch of bitter ones up in Michigan at some point. And it just, it it made me so sad. Um, I found one um, when I was hiking. uh, I was actually at an event out in Pennsylvania called Penzig. And as I was walking, I saw a bullet in a ditch and I like suddenly ran down there and I grabbed it and I tested it. It was a actual porcini. And so I, I ate it immediately. I didn't even cook it. I just ate it. And <laughs> I think that's the one that I want to get out in the wild the most. Um, I do love finding morels because they, you'll look in the same area and sometimes they're so well hidden. And then suddenly you see one And if you're with somebody else, you hoot and you holler, and then you span out to try and find more. Because if you find one, you should find more. Um, So that's exciting when you find that one and the flags go off, the fanfare, and everybody gets excited. Um, So, yeah, I think the the bullet mushroom is, is probably my top. 
Um, and I might just have to end up growing them and cultivating them out in the, the yard at some point. Um, what was the, uh, the question next was about canning and other avenues. Yep. Um, since I started gardening out in the back, I knew that I was going to have to start food preservation as a, as a major step in preserving what we had and not only to, to uh, open up avenues for canning and dehydrating mushrooms and other vegetables, but just to start practicing today. Um, of course, I had this in place to do and I started growing vegetables and then there was a can shortage and you couldn't find jars anywhere. And I was losing my mind, and I actually I got a bunch of them donated to me. Uh, somebody's um, somebody's family didn't need them anymore, so I got a bunch of jars to get me started, and then some other friends had helped me out. Um, and now you can find them on the shelf, of course, but um, I knew I needed to get my feet wet um, because growing things like uh, carrots... And these are heirloom carrots. Um, I didn't collect seeds because I have plenty of uh, carrot seeds, but growing like tomatoes. And I mean, these are just uh, done um, in a vinegar. So they're pickled because um, I don't have one of the big pressure cookers yet to do canning on a major scale. I'm even in a canning group or two to give me that extra knowledge and to get those recipes. Uh, but food preservation was important. Yeah, learning simple things like put your flour in the freezer for a couple of days to kill any bugs. Then you can long-term store it in a plastic container and worry less about it going bad and getting flour weevils in it. Um, little things like that or taking eggs and uh, using a solution to just store eggs with the shell on for a long term and looking at a lot of stuff with food preservation um, this was a good year to practice um, like I grow uh, lemon balm and so I took some in uh, safflower oil and uh, lemon balm is good at elevating your mood um, some say you know just for depression um, as kind of a generic, but it, it does elevate your mood along with things like uh, lavender. And it's also good for the skin. So I started to try and find ways to do that. And um, then eventually getting into uh, doing tinctures and elixirs. Um, I grow out in the garden a couple of things that can be used against uh, sore throats. And I thought, what a better way if, um, you know, my child gets a bad cough and I just give them a good, you know, cough syrup that I've made that's just a, like a, it's a plant called whorehound. Um, and just to use that, and if it's more serious, then to go from there. Um, so the food preservation on all avenues, drying food, storing food, canning food were major things um we're working on our basement currently so hopefully in the future we'll have more space to store cans again this was a practice here so hopefully next year i'll have a big fancy cooker to do um canned meats and other things and then um i can free up some of the space in our deep freezer that's full of uh chicken meat and duck meat and everything else right. so um let's kind of wrap up there's a lot of people watching and we've had a consistent number of people just taking things in and uh so to wrap things up um kind of two things one is you you refer you know quite a bit to community and um barter and you know sharing things with folks that don't have um and in terms of like the idea of community talk to us about 
that social um, connection with those that you forage with. So it's not only about, right, it's finding the, finding that mushroom, but it's searching for it that probably has some some uh, uh, magical properties, let's say, and I just use magical as a, you know, just a, a, a fun word. So talk to us about that process of building community relationship in that foraging process, even if it's your, your groups, your community, or just you and your husband and your child, going out in the woods and walking and looking for that. And then talk to us about the Missy Mushroom, your channel on uh, on YouTube. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we, we have a Malinois and he's very insistent. Um, so he's a Belgian shepherd and they, they need a lot of uh, constant work. Um, so uh, to get started um, working with the community, um, especially during now where a lot of a lot of stuff is digital, um, the great portion of people don't understand what's at their fingertips to access um, in terms of information. Now, unfortunately, because you do have this, um, what I see is the copy and paste where you have a website where they take the exact same information and they just paste it. And so you have no new information. It's just that constant, you know, repetition. And I noticed that unfortunately with a lot of like historical um, searching that I was doing on the writing the paper about ducks. And so, you know, I wanted to be able to provide information that was a little outside of the box and to try and you know put something new on the table or at least be a bit more concise with what i have and working with the community having the online community and again sometimes the oversaturation can lead towards um misinformation but there is a lot of good information involved in contacting people and getting a hold of all of those resources. Um, so I, I, I'm constantly, uh, when I get something that I think is new and exciting, or at least isn't talked about enough, I will definitely post that up in one of those groups. Um, little things like discovering that tomato hornworms or tobacco hornworms, hornworms in general, um, that they glow under a black light. Little things like that where most gardeners don't know that, you know, they'll use seven dust or other pesticides, but if you go out, you can suddenly just use a handheld light and find all of these worms on your tomato plants and you can just pick them off. Um, but looking and trying to provide that extra information, um, you know, allows me also to connect with people, uh, locally and to build those relationships, uh, utilizing social media. Um, cause when I get around to selling mushrooms, going to farmer's markets, um, talking to people that work in restaurants that are more open towards using cultivated mushrooms in their business. That's something where having those connections, I think are absolutely crucial and getting resources that I don't have is also something that's really important. Um, knowing people that are skilled in things and crafts that are beyond me it's entirely helpful because then you get that extra information added to the pot. So I look at what works and what doesn't work. And then I can at least add to that discussion and hopefully improve the community around me. Uh, locally, that's something where this year, you know, if we've been here on this property now for about two years. And I feel like just this year, I finally went to the library <laughs> and I, and I love books and I, and I order a lot of books, but 
It was that, you know, branching out finally and getting to know what's in your community, getting to know what resources are there, getting to know how you can improve the community around you. So that was what I definitely recommend and wanted to do for myself. And it helped me a lot, um, like getting those connections, even through something that's completely unrelated, like working for the Haunted Hydro and having people like Bob Turner, who had connections to somebody, you know, like you, and to have that opportunity then, um, you know, just to get out there. And that's something that um, it's, it's almost a risk. And a lot of people don't want to take a risk, but, you know, you're not losing anything, honestly. Um, so get involved with your community and the programs that are there. Well, I... Even if I, um, and, and I want to personally thank um, uh, well several folks. One for you know the Turners because I've been you know blessed to to get to know uh, um, a bunch of folks as a result of knowing the Turners. Uh, but Jennifer Hartley too because I was really I was like man. Um, Julie's got a great look. Her modeling, her effects, her painting, and all these are are you know top notch. And, and what I try to do is I try to space out the special effects because we got a big special effects. But when I heard about the Misty Mushroom, I was like, now that is something unique and different that I'm really excited to learn more about. And so to find about your hear about your other life and your other um, interests is is equally. Uh, perhaps more exciting than than your visual arts and your modeling and all those things that you do. So um, finish us off by telling us how to contact you, like where where you would drive people, um, as well as talk about Misty Mushroom and you know maybe not only you know how do we contact you on Facebook but YouTube and websites, other platforms. Platforms. Yeah, definitely want to thank thank Jen for for throwing my name out there to you because you're you're in my feed, but you know how those algorithms work. I don't always see everything, so her like nudging, and I saw it, and I was like, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the best way to contact me is generally through Facebook Messenger. Um, even though my my regular facebook page it's it's pretty it's pretty open in many ways but at the same time i've been regulating a bit more on what friends i have um i would definitely suggest if you have questions regarding uh my business you have questions regarding uh, mushrooms in general or you have um, any side questions on any resources if you want actual listings of books um or any permaculture information um, definitely contact me through the Misty Mushroom Facebook page. Um, because that messenger, I get noted a lot faster than I do an email. Um, and my YouTube channel is really for generating conversation for any of those videos. I definitely recommend people um, looking, watching them, commenting. Just that generating conversation does a lot for me to get that information out there and circulated. Um, but any questions, direct them towards the Misty Mushroom Facebook page. Um, and I will uh, be working on this next year in cultivating um, mushrooms for the year. Um, because of COVID, unfortunately, the supplies that I wanted, um, I tried a new method of, of um germinating the mushrooms, the cultures, and it failed. <laughs> so at that point, I didn't have another opportunity. But upcoming in spring, I will be starting new cultures, and I will be starting those um, to be hopeful in circulation. I haven't absolutely decided yet which cultures I'm going to choose. Um, I'll definitely be doing some um, oysters, but I may be branching off and doing a few others that can grow inside 
Um, in the garden, I will be adding wine caps. Wine caps can be added to the soil and uh, they will crop up everywhere. Um, I'll be testing my hand at the morels. Um, so soon I will have varieties that will be available to sell, um, but I will put all those updates on that Facebook page of when that availability um, comes up to market. And as always, I'm, I'm always open for just general conversation regarding any of the things that I'm interested in. I got a random question in another group regarding how to build a wooden drum, like a, a shaman drum. And it was such a random thing that I actually had done research on, but somebody asking me something so random, and I was like, well, let me tell you, <laughs> um, because I, um, I've even done things on the side like taxidermy and uh, some other oddball hobbies. And so I'm definitely open. And if I don't know the answer, I will openly say I don't know. I will try and direct you where you can find the information or at least give you an info of the groups that I'm in to hopefully expand yourself a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of YouTube channels I do watch, and I can always recommend those as well. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that covers it as a whole. Well, I want to say, I want to personally thank you for spending this Tuesday evening with us. Uh, you are certainly renaissance. I've come to that, uh, that, that, uh, Obvious conclusion after probably our first five minutes, probably after just watching you from afar as the makeup artist and your other stuff, but to hear about all your other things, you are certainly a renaissance. And we thank you for sharing your journey, some tips, your passion about uh, permaculture and, and, and mushrooms. And, uh, and again, for anybody who shares this video, um, we'll be placing your name in and uh, we'll be drawing um, drawing a name out of, uh, you know, as a drawing next week. And you'll have mushrooms straight from Julie's uh, possession straight to your uh, your place. So I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and give you back the, the mic if there's anything that you want to close with or what we might see in 2021 and then we'll just say good night <laughs> i realize now as an afterthought um that i did dress entirely drab and practical because i came back from a journey on the road and i i was considering wearing some of my like more elaborate tunics and maybe some fun sunglasses um but no, I, I, I am about as practical right now. This is me in my normal element. Um, I do appreciate um, anybody who likes, shares, subscribes my videos on YouTube. All of that helps me out. Um, liking the Misty Mushroom page on Facebook, um, liking the posts always helps out because every time you like those posts, it boosts them up in the feed. And the more interest that's generated the more that my business has the opportunity uh, to branch out and to um, get into more people's households to hopefully improve their lives. And, you know, look forward to what I'm doing in the upcoming year. I've got a lot of things that are set in place that I'll be planning, and I will be producing more videos and random off the topics. Um, one that I'm going to be doing here shortly is actually about um, cooking grits in an, in an uh, Instapot and how you can feed a family of five under a dollar. And so I'm going to be talking about doing that recipe and um, all about that. And I'm trying to do a little bit more on my videos to make them a bit more interesting. Um, but unfortunately, with time constraints and having a 10-month-old, that doesn't always come into play. So bear with me as I go through my journey and 
join me and and send me your stuff if you want to expand um, your business or what you do. Let me know. I love liking and I love watching new videos. Thank you again, Julie, for sharing your journey. Uh, we appreciate uh, your gift of knowledge that that you provided to us. Uh, Julie Parsons just commented that she worked next to you next. Uh, she worked next to you during the monster make off at the reformatory last year. So we got shout outs. Um, please go back and give us a few links in this so we can go ahead and check your videos so we can for those of us that may be lazy we can just click the link go over to your youtube page find out about the mushrooms that you're going to be giving away and also check out all your uh, other great knowledge and and have a great night great night thank you